It's so good to see so many interesting, lovely, wonderful people here. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, this feels, uh, before I moved to Roehampton, I did three years as a prep school head teacher. So this sort of takes me back to the old days. And I feel as though I'm kind of doing an assembly at the moment. So I take as my text today um, the words uh, from, from the Bible according to Gove. Well, not that Bible according to Gove. This is the Bet speech. Um, he talks somewhere down there about an open source world and about a wiki curriculum. And it's those concepts that I want to spend the next 10 minutes or so exploring with you this morning. So what is this open source stuff? Well, here are oh, half a dozen open source products. Anybody in the room managed to identify all six from the icons alone? Well done. Okay, so we have two geeks. Two geeks amongst us. Uh, let's just quickly go around what we've got. Firefox there. Who's using Firefox as their browser of choice? Okay. Um, Android, which is open source. If you want to download the source code for the Android platform, there's a Google code site where you can do that. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it apart from the very, very brave. Moodle, possibly the world's favorite learning environment. Who's using Moodle in their schools? Well, it's not quite the majority, but not far off. Um, then we've got Scratch. Is there anybody in the room who doesn't know Scratch? Okay, L learn about Scratch. Come and talk to us later about Scratch. Scratch, when you see Scratch, you'll love it. I think everybody falls in love with Scratch, don't they? Um, and then we've got WordPress. Who's using WordPress blogs in their school? Brilliant. And Apache. Who knows that their web server is running Apache? Who thinks they're Apache? they may well be running Apache, but they have people to deal with that. Okay, so we have all of these robust best of breed, I would argue, some may wish to disagree, open source products. How do these things get written? What can we learn from the way products like this get made when it comes to developing a curriculum for our schools? A number of things. When we think about open source, I think the thing which many of us immediately caught on to is the notion is free. We don't have to pay for this. We don't have to get the bursar's approval or get it through school finance managers. We can just have a go with this stuff and nobody really needs to sort of worry too much. So you have this notion of open source is free as in free beer. There is, is there free beer? No free beer. Sorry about that. Okay. But you also have, and this is central to the notion of open source, this notion of free as in free speech that because you've got access to the source code and the licenses allow you to do what you want, then lots and lots of freedoms come with that. So how does that apply in curriculum terms? Well, you've not had to pay to deliver the national curriculum. I mean, those documents have been there for free from the department's website. Um, you don't have to pay for the NACE curriculum. You don't have to pay for the curriculum framework. You don't have to pay for the CAS curriculum. There are other curricula out there which you do have to pay for, which do work on a subscription model, and I don't think any of us are thinking that way. But free as in speech is where it really gets interesting because whilst the national curriculum as it stood, the program of study was a, you know, here it is, you know, that's not something you can tinker with. I think we're moving over the next two years of this period of the disapplied program of study to thinking about curriculum in terms of, yeah, we can change this. We can take what they've had for the last however many years and change that, adapt that, make it our own. So we've got access, if you wish, to the source code, the notion of the recipe as well as the meal. You know, is it important that you know about computing? I would say yes, it kind of is, because, yeah, in order to survive, you need to eat. But in order to, you know, the, your life is so much richer if you have that experience that I can make a meal from ingredients. I can use a recipe book. I don't have to just go and buy the food off the shelf. I can get involved in that process. Um, and the same, I think, applies to curriculum, that it's not enough anymore just to be handed a curriculum and told to get on and teach that. Have a look at what the ideas are that went into that. See how you can tweak those, how you can adapt those, how you can make those right for your organization. Make the changes. Take what's there and tweak this, which is what you can do with open source code. You know, if you've, uh, those of you who've got Moodle or are running WordPress, you've got access to the source <coughs> code there. And PHP is a sufficiently simple language for us to be able to go in and say, oh, yeah, I can figure out that that does that. And you're empowered through that process. You can make those changes. Okay, don't worry too much when it comes to the versions being upgraded. Eric Raymond, who's one of the great theorists of the open source movement, talks about this difference between a cathedral-like model and a bazaar-like model. So the cathedral, we have somebody in authority says, this is how it should be, this is designed for us. You know, done to the best of people's ability. Please don't get me wrong here. Done to the greater glory of a higher 
power. There's Michael Gove for you again. But and it's, it's, it's a wonderful, splendid thing. But there are other models. Um, this is kind of how we've gone about curriculum development in the past. It's kind of how we teach some bits of software development. Anybody still teaching waterfall methodology up at A-level ICT? I'm sorry to hear that, Brian. Okay. <laughs> it's still there as part of the syllabus requirement. So, yeah, this is how we've done curriculum thus far. You know, somebody comes up with a set of requirements. Children should learn Latin. Children should learn poems. Children should learn long division or whatever. The great and the good, they go off and design a document based on that. It comes to the likes of you and me to go and implement that in school. We do plenty of verification, OEST uh, testing, very important part of that process. And then occasionally we'll sort of send out schemes of work or we'll present the attainment targets in a slightly easier bullet pointed way to make it easier for people to understand. But we just keep things ticking over. This does doesn't work particularly well when it comes to big software projects. The NHS database, you know, case in point, I'm not sure that it has actually done as particularly well when it comes to curriculum design, and that could be one of the reasons behind the problems which the Royal Society report on. So what's the alternative? Something a little more bizarre, and I'm spelling that with an A in the second place for anybody who's tweeting this, that we have this notion of let's just put everything on tables and let people come and choose and select. And the things which work, the things which are good, are the ones which people will keep coming back to. And you bring something of yourself to this. You contribute to this, rather than just taking what you're given. In terms of software development, and I would argue in terms of curriculum design, we move from a waterfall type approach to a much more agile approach. That, yeah, the things on the right-hand side there, they're fine. Following a plan, not a bad thing. I would say this to my Roehampton students. Negotiating the details, deciding exactly what it is you're going to do, that's okay, that's important. Documenting everything, fine. Looking at the processes, looking at the tools. These things are all fine, they have their place. But wouldn't it be better to focus our attention on the things on the left-hand side of that screen, about being responsive, about being literally agile, as the environment changes, as the circumstances changes, as the knowledge that the children you're teaching changes, what they bring with them into the classroom, then responding to that in a much more sort of agile sort of way. If we don't necessarily talk about customers, we talk about children, we talk about students, but collaborating with them. What is it you know how to do already? How can we move you on from that? What is it you'd like to learn about? Let me see if I can find some way of teaching you that. Concentrating on, not so much on working software, but on working knowledge rather than necessarily following all of that sort of documented planning. Getting knowledge which works, getting things which are immediately applicable. And of course, you know, I'm not saying agile development doesn't do lots of testing, but you have very, very granular unit level testing. You have a bit of code and you check that that bit of code works. In our line of work, we call this assessment for learning, I would suggest. And then focusing on the individuals, focusing on the interactions inside the classroom. There are better things still, or at least some people argue that there are better things. So you have the Agile Manifesto there. You also have the software craftsmanship folk who say, yeah, those things from Agile Manifesto, very, very good, but we can go further still than that and look at that sort of really emphasizing the excellence of what happens in software craftsmanship projects, and let's apply that in our line of work too. So it's fine, yeah, think about collaboration, but also think in terms of partnership, both within, and I would suggest, outside of the school. Working knowledge, that's all well and good, but actually something, you know, the lessons that are really beautifully crafted, that really do gel. I'm not suggesting you laminate those lesson plans, unlike Nick Gibb, who th seems to think that's a good idea. But, you know, focus on individuals' inter interactions by all means, but think of your classroom as learning community too, and think of that extended community. You know, you're all here as part of an extended community of practice. Isn't that some sort of experience that you'd want the children in your class to have as well? So look at things like Young Rewired State, which go beyond that. Open source does community really, really well. Those of you using Moodle, those of you using WordPress, you'll know how much of that is contributed by a whole community of people, not just the core development team. And isn't that something which we could do when it comes to curriculum design, that we don't have to have you know, something given to us? We can all bring something of our insights. If you've got a brilliant lesson on you know, teaching, sorting using Scratch, then put that into a community place somewhere and share that with others so they can draw from that. Plenty of places where you can share those resources. But think about that in other terms too. You have with open source, again, it's an Eric Raymond quote, that to many eyes all bugs are shallow, that the more people you have working on a problem who've got access to the source code, who are allowed to 
contribute to it, the easier it is to spot the mistakes and to fix the mistakes. And again, perhaps if we'd seen curriculum development over the last few years as more of a collaborative community-based project, we wouldn't have got to the state that we're in. You also, again with open source, the Moodle is in the room, the WordPress users in the room will know this, you have this modular structure to it. So you don't have to do the whole blooming thing yourself. You can take from one place and another place. And the idea for so many of these projects is to have small interoperable components. That's you know right at the foundation of the new Linux operating system. Um, and yeah, the other thing I want to say is that open source is a tremendously empowering approach. And I think that's something we're, we're ready for this when it comes to developing an ICT curriculum. We have the power over the next couple of years during this period of disapplication. Those of you working in the independent sector, those of you who in two years' time will be working in a primary academy or a secondary academy, those of you who are working in free schools, you have that autonomy over your curriculum already. What we've had... This is my conversation with my friend Dan Bowen on Twitter over the weekend. And, you know, somebody, uh, Harry Denton says, that, are there any schools that are using open source for their infrastructure? We were doing this, you know, the last school I was working in. And, you know, Dan says, but Miles, you're a geek, you're a techie. You can do this sort of thing. My point was, though, that actually I'm kind of self-taught. You know, I have an O-level in computer studies, but other than that... Um, but... We had the sort of advantages which, Steve, which Herman Hauser gave to the original ARM team of not having you know, money and not having people to do this sort of thing for you, which is why I sort of learned how to do much of this for myself. Um, and open source has allowed me and allows others to do that. The, one of the arguments you get against open source is, oh, it's much harder than doing Windows. I don't think it necessarily is, or it's much harder than using proprietary platforms. I really don't think it is. But you have the ability to do far, far more. But we've ended up focusing so much on end-user skills that we have a whole generation of teachers who say, hmm, looks, looks difficult, I'm not going to have a go at that, when actually what we want is a generation of teachers and a generation to come of students of pupils who say, OK, well, I've never done this before, but I'll have a go. What's the worst that can happen? Let's just, have, let's just see... What happens? If I get stuck, what am I going to do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is Google it or use Bing. Other search engines are available, I believe. <laughs> um, you know, what else, can, what else can I do? Well, I'm going to talk to the other people in the community about this. Yeah? And just as this applies to software, it also, I reckon, applies to curriculum design and indeed teaching. You know, writing a scheme of work, writing a curriculum, whoa, no, 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 that's far too hard for me. I'm only a teacher. Of course it isn't. Of course it isn't. Start with a piece of paper and say, this is what I believe the children in our school should learn about. And then, you know, go and talk to the community and go and have a look what other people have done and compare and contrast those. So, yeah, you can have a starting place that, you know, you don't have to start from a blank piece of paper. And I would like to put, you know, put in a plug here for NACE's ICT framework. Jan Webb, third row from the back. Give everybody a wave, Jan. Okay, good person to talk to about the NACE ICT framework. We also have the Computing at Schools curriculum for schools. Tom, good person to talk to about that. Other Computing at Schools folk? Okay, well, we can talk to you know, me about either of those as well. But these are both released under Creative Commons licenses, yeah? For both of these documents, you can take the bits that you like, copy those, paste those, into the document for your school. Develop your own curriculum. Or, you know, you say, actually, I really like all of the NACE curriculum. I really like all of the CAS curriculum. I don't like that bit. You're allowed to change that. You're allowed to use this as a starting point and make what you do your own. And I'm really optimistic. You know, the, the announcement, which I think we are now allowed to go public about, about NACE and CAS working together on this agreed framework, I think bodes very, very well for taking the ideas from both of those and looking at that as a starting point for the road ahead. Um, so yeah, we need some sort of platform. One of the reasons open source now works is you've got this whole internet thingy which allows people to collaborate across distances. So you have the stuff which SourceForge is very good at. Of, you know, Here are some open source projects. Download this, fork this. GitHub, which is an amazing bit of code, or amazing platform for working on open source projects there. And you can use it for other things too. You know, It's a proper version control system. Yes, it works beautifully for source code, but it also works well for text files. And, of course, the Wikibooks stuff. Um, Peter Kemp writing a brilliant A-level 
textbook inside Wikibooks and inviting comments from all sorts of people. And it's because it's there as a wiki, you can go in, take what you want of that, and change that. So a wiki-type approach to the curriculum. Within that context of particularly computing, but I think generally in ICT, how brilliant these open source project products are. Get yourself a Linux box, or get yourself an old computer and put Linux on it. It doesn't need to be a state-of-the-art machine. Install MySQL, install Apache, install PHP, and you may as well put Python on there whilst you're at it. And you have then a brilliant platform for children creating their own web pages, for children sharing their web pages with one another. That stuff's easy but also for children getting in and coding up whole web-based platforms. If you want WordPress, if you want Moodle, then you can have those for free on your own Linux box inside the school, running as your own Apache web server. One thing which you could do when you get back to school tomorrow, you know, go and build yourself a, a, a Linux web server. It's not that difficult. There are instructions somewhere on the interweb. You know, tweet me and I'll find you some, really. Um, there are interesting books about this. Um, the one on the left there, you can get it off the internet. Um, this is Future Lab talking about the same sort of thing as I've been talking about this morning, taking open source ideas and applying them to other sorts of problems in education, an open source approach to education rather than just an open source approach to code. Uh, Douglas Rushkoff writing ooh, a few years ago now uh, about open source democracy, and I think there are links between that and the big society, not that we hear very much about the big society these days, do we? Also, Douglas Rushkoff's book on the right there, Program or Be Program, that this sort of empowerment that you get by being involved with the sort of nuts and bolts level of the tech really does matter. And this is what it's all about. This is why events like today are so important, that, you know, let's work together on these problems. This is where CAS, this is where NACE come into their own, this platform for collaborating with teachers sharing ideas, teachers sharing their expertise, their enthusiasm. If you're not sure about something, there'll be other people in these communities who are and can help you with this. Um, if you do want to get in touch, then there's a Twitter thingy and an email address, what should we call it, and a blog, which I very rarely keep up to date up on the screen behind me. Thank you all very much this morning.